no way she could stab three grown men. That's a bit sexist. A woman could easily kill a man with the right motivation. Wait, is this fucking play about us? Reading Shakespeare Adaptations Part 3. This one's for all of my theater history lovers out there. This is Bernhardt Hamlet by Teresa Rebeck, which is about Sarah Bernhardt's production of Hamlet in which she played Hamlet. Now, she isn't the first woman to play Hamlet in history. There are other women who have played her in before her, but she, as a woman in the 19th century, did receive a lot of criticism from the public for taking on just the role of all roles, Hamlet. But you know, she's the divine Sarah. Like, she can do whatever she wants. She sleeps in a coffin and she can do whatever she wants. They talk about that in the play. Um, but I really think that Sarah Bernhardt is one of the most well-respected, most famous, most popular female actors of the 19th century. She did multiple tours of the US. She's from France. She was a very flamboyant, eccentric, very emotionally driven actor. You know, she's definitely a product of the romantic movement. And this play does a really excellent job of portraying the struggles of women in theater. You should read it. <laughs> Sensational. Reading Shakespeare novels, part one. Actors are by nature volatile, alchemic creatures composed of incendiary elements, emotion and ego and envy. Heat them up, stir them together, and sometimes you get gold, sometimes disaster. Bardolatry. This is If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, and quite frankly, it's probably my favorite book on the face of the earth. And you might be thinking, that's a little bit traumatic, but let me put you onto this. It is set at a classical conservatory school. It's a murder mystery, and all of the characters are actors. It's so well written, the characters are so beautifully balanced, and they all represent different archetypes, and the storytelling is just immaculate. The vibes, dark academia, everything you could ever want. She literally says, you can justify anything if you do it poetically enough. These characters eat, sleep, breathe, drink, live Shakespeare. They literally speak fluent Shakespeare to each other, and this setting is just so intoxicatingly beautiful but scary, I would sell my soul to go to this school. This book is so good. I, can't, I literally will never stop talking about how good this book is. You need to read it. This is art. It's a full-time job and it's extremely time consuming and it's not as easy as it may appear to some people. And you wonder why you came, where did I go wrong? Reading Shakespeare Adaptations Part so this is Twelve Ophelias, a play with broken songs by Caridad Svitch, and it is a feminist postmodern continuation of Hamlet through the eyes of Ophelia, set in a neo-Elizabethan Appalachian setting where Gertrude runs a brothel and Hamlet is called a rude boy. Postmodernism, people! It literally starts with Ophelia like rising out of the water. I'm obsessed. If you love Ophelia, you're gonna love this play. However, I think that it's probably a better theatrical experience to watch than it is to read. I love this play. I love the integration of the traditional dialogue with the new contemporary stuff. I think that it's beautiful and I really want to hear these songs performed. It's incredibly haunting, but I think that it's a production that is meant to be seen. And I think that a process creating this show would be so insightful and really, really cool. If you love Ophelia, you're gonna love this play. I can't talk right now. I'm doing hot girl Fuck being good, I'm a bad bitch. I'm sick of motherfuckers trying to tell me how to live. Black holes hate under my pictures on the gram. Bitch, you better hope I never run across your man. Uh. Being Shakespeare adaptations, part five. So this is Imogen Says Nothing, but the full title is Imogen Says Nothing, The Annotated Life of Imogen of Messina, last cited in the first folio of William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing by Aditi Brennan Capil. I hope I said that right. Anyways, it's a um, revisionist comedy featuring a character named Imogen who only appears in the stage directions in the first folio of Much Ado About Nothing and has since then been dismissed as a typo, even though we have an Imogen in Cymbeline. Anyways, it's a feminist hijacking of Shakespeare that investigates the voices in Shakespeare's canon that have been silenced and 
practically cut out entirely than the consequences that come with that. It's a meditation on women in society, gender roles in society, as well as bear baiting, that's really important, and the persecution of women and othering. I really like this play. It's a little bit odd, but I love it. Good morning, everyone. God has let me live another day, and I am about to make it everyone's problem. How many fish in the sea? It'll be so empty without me. Now this looks like on top of me. Oh, Lord. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just in a silly, goofy mood. Uh Wait, what? You're not coming to my tea party? Bethany, I made biscuits! Reading Shakespeare Adaptations Part 6. Quick disclaimer, um, I know that I'm using the term adaptation very loosely, um, just don't know what else to call this series. Plays about Shakespeare? Plays with Shakespeare? So this one is also for my theater history lovers out there. This is Nell Gwynn by Jessica Swale, and it's about Nell Gwynn, who is one of the most famous Restoration Period actresses in England, and she got her start as an orange seller, but perhaps she is most well known to be the mistress of Charles II. And so this play is both a commentary on and structured like a Restoration comedy, and so I think that makes for a beautiful celebration of theater because we're coming out of the interregnum where Oliver Cromwell literally like bans theater. We hate Oliver Cromwell. And obviously Charles II brings theater back, and so it's a celebration of theater, of women on stage, and of this woman who is very much ahead of her time. It is a hilarious and heartwarming yet vulnerable story about this woman who does what it takes to survive and to make her way in the world. And I cried and I laughed, but perhaps one of the biggest takeaways is how gossip informs legend. So I think that's um, also, it does poke fun at Shakespeare, so that's why I can talk about it, because on page 46, she says, Juliet is a noodle. Who wrote that twaddle anyway? And someone says, William Shakespeare. And she says, well, he should learn to write proper plays, or at least let his wife have a go. So, you know what? It fits. It's also so good. You should read it. Look, here comes the consequence, 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 consequences of my actions chasing me right now. I don't want no consequence, consequence, consequence. I don't want no consequences chasing me right now. Someone take this consequence, consequence, consequence. Someone take this consequence and chasing me right now. Jesus is the consequence, consequence, consequence. Jesus is the consequence chasing me right now. Ah! Nobody is as excited for the big celebration as I am. I am not scientifically possible. Reading and reading Shakespeare's canon in order of the historical chronology of the settings, part 14, Edward III. Okay, you're probably asking yourself, what the heck is this play? I've never heard of it before. Did Shakespeare even write this? And you know, that's fair. Did he write this? <laughs> the world may never know. But scholars are like, maybe he did. And so it's in my riverside, and so alas, here we are. Okay, so this is a history about King Edward III, and it is tonally very different than all of Shakespeare's other histories, which is why I think that maybe Marlowe wrote this, especially because he did write Edward II. It has some gorgeous, gorgeous poetry, and I laughed a lot, although I think it was at inappropriate times, but the plot between the first half of the text and the second half of the text, like, shifts very drastically. It's a little bit jarring, like, it goes from this whole, like, bluff scandal with a countess, and like, oh, marry me, no, to politics and war and misunderstood prophecies and descending ravens. I'm gonna give it three stars. It was actually a pretty entertaining play. I wish you well. I wish you well. In hell. <laughs> <laughs> I really Burn let's, in hell. Let, let's try. It's Shakespeare Tuesday tea time, and today we're talking about Romeo and Juliet as a comedy. Okay, so this is actually some tea because Shakespeare wrote it as a satire after Christopher Marlowe wrote Dido Queen of Carthage, and so it's a commentary on the trope of true and immediate love. And so is what happens at the end very tragic? Absolutely, not trying to undermine that at all. It's really sad and it was easily avoidable, but if we're gonna look at Romeo and Juliet compared to all of the other tragedies like Macbeth and King Lear, Romeo doesn't really hold a candle to those tragic heroes, especially if we look at the roots of tragedy with Greek tragedy. You know, Romeo doesn't really fit the criteria of a tragic hero. And so, yes, it's tragic, but it's not a tragedy. Also, Juliet is a better written character and more emotionally developed character than Romeo, so what does it say about the tragic hero? I don't know, but that's the tea. Is it me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. 
Maybe I am. Am I the villain? I don't think I'm the villain. Incredible. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. It's Shakespeare Tuesday tea time, and today we're talking about the timeline variants of King Lear. So 1606 is when King Lear was first performed, and so we're gonna jump ahead a couple of decades into the Interregnum, where we have Oliver Cromwell, 1649, he's gonna ban theater, we hate Oliver Cromwell, and then the Restoration happens beginning in 1660, and the Restoration period in theater will last until about 1710. Now in 1681, a playwright named Nahum Tate, this plant, oh my gosh, um, decides, you know what, I love King Lear, but you know what would make it even better? If it was a tragic comedy, with a sprinkling of romance in it. So he rewrites the ending, so Cordelia doesn't die, there's no fool, and then Cordelia and Edgar get married and live happily ever after and become king and queen. That kind of undermines the whole point of the play. Anyways, but it wasn't until 1838, 1838, that scholars realized this isn't the real version of King Lear, so. Okay. I was already really excited for this revival because I love Macbeth and I think the theater community loves Macbeth. We're on a Macbeth train right now. I mean, come on, how many like productions of Macbeth have there been recently and like the movie and everything? We just, we love Macbeth. We live for Macbeth, right? But hello, 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 hello. She's literally like, peace out Hades town, I'm gonna go play Banquo on Broadway. Hello. because it's hot outside and talking about how Shakespeare sucks up to the monarchy. Shakespeare is a grade A butt kisser, especially to the monarchy because like why wouldn't you want to be a butt kisser to the monarchy when they literally hold your life in their hands and you don't want to be accused of treason but also like money, money, money. And if I were a theater person in the Elizabethan era, I would want their endorsement or money as well. So Shakespeare writing plays literally for the monarchy is something that is totally understandable and fully believable. Now there's three plays that I want to talk about in this series that are especially influenced by the monarchy and I guess socio-political tensions surrounding the monarchy. And so with Elizabeth, that's going to be Henry VIII and Julius Caesar. And then with James I, it's going to be Macbeth. So I'm really excited to talk about these because I think it's really interesting how politics affect drama. Screaming, crying, Okay there, Olaf? Oh yeah! We're calling this controlling what you can when things feel out of control. I like you, have a cupcake. I like you, have a cupcake. Just stay alive, that would be enough. Whoa, the bar is so much slower than I ever imagined. What a shame she's fucked in the head. cobbled together all the best features from all the best guys and then gave him a tragic backstory. It's like he was designed specifically to appeal to me. I gotta put me first. I gotta put me first. I gotta put me first, Lucian. I promise you. Our conversations ain't long, but you know what is. 